All right, everyone, welcome back to Calculus 3. Um, so as you can see on the page here, today is going to be a, a very important lecture because we're getting to the climax of the course here. Uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, the first in our series of fundamental theorems uh, of calculus, uh, the versions in higher dimensions, at least. So this is going to be the first one, and then we're going to be ascending one dimension uh, every class for the next few classes. Um, so let's remember what the original fundamental theorem of calculus is. So this states that if you do the definite integral of a derivative of a function, then they more or less cancel out. So we have an integral and a derivative and both of them go away and you just have something only involving the original function left behind here. Um, so we just have f of b minus f of a. And this is how we compute most uh, single variable integrals. We just find the antiderivative of this and then plug in the number. So it really is a fundamental theorem in calculus because this is how we integrate most functions. All right, so the as we saw last class, line integrals are sort of a, a generalization of uh, ordinary integrals. So line integrals, the path can kind of wiggle around the plane, whereas ordinary integrals, you're kind of confined to have your area on an axis. Uh, so because these are similar, they're going to end up having similar um, fundamental theorems of calculus. Now, why would this be a fundamental theorem of calculus? Well, we have an integral here. And then we have this guy, this is the gradient. And remember the gradient is the partial derivative of a function in each dimension. We have the X dimension with X, Y dimension with the Y derivative, and Z dimension with the Z derivative, if we have it. Um, so this is our integral and this is our derivative. So we would expect in a fundamental theorem of calculus that uh, they're going to cancel out in some way and we'll just be left with the function. And that's indeed what happens. We end up with F, and if there's a parameterization of this path C right here, we have our end point of our path minus the initial point plugged into our function. So this is gonna be F of R of B minus F of R of A. So this is very similar to what we had back here with the fundamental theorem of calculus, except now as our inputs, we can have something that has multiple variables, but essentially the idea is still the same. You still have an integral and a derivative and they kind of cancel out and they end up just leaving these functions behind right here. Okay, now remember we were talking about these conservative vector fields before, right? And the nice thing about them is that they were the gradient of some other function. So if you do the line integral of a conservative vector field, you can rewrite that f as um, the gradient of something else. And then we could use the fundamental theorem of line integrals to write this as f of r of b minus f of r of a. So this also works for just general vector fields so long as they're conservative. Then we can go ahead and do this right here. Um, let's see, uh, is the result a vector? No, these, these aren't vectors right here. This, so this is a scalar function minus a scalar. So the result is going to be a scalar here. The vector is going to be uh, the input though. Oh, is the mic, is the mic not working again? It's always like five minutes into class. Uh, <laughs> it always seems to break. All right, so let's go ahead and put this into practice here. Let's take a look at this. So let's evaluate this line integral right here, f dot dr along the path c, where f is 2xy plus z, x squared and x. So f is this vector field. And c is a path from 1, negative 1, 2 to 2, 2, 3. Now the thing is they say c is a path, but they don't specify what kind of path it is. So we could squiggle around in between these points. We could go directly from here to here. They don't say what type of path it is, so there's no way to parameterize this curve based on the information that we're given. So we got to hope that this vector field is conservative, or at least we, we got to hope that that happens, uh, so that we could use the fundamental theorem for line integrals because that only cares about the endpoints. Kind of like how 
the original fundamental theorem of calculus only depends on endpoints right here, like we just plug B and A into the function, uh, our new fundamental theorem also only depends on the endpoints here. All right, so let's check to see if this is conservative. And, and how do we do that again? Well, we label each of the components here, and traditionally it's P, Q, and R, and then we check the, the cross partials. So for example, we would do the P der or the derivative of this with respect to Y, even though it's the X component. Uh, let's see, the derivative of this with respect to Y would be two X. And then we do the derivative with respect of Q with respect to Y, or sorry, X, and the derivative of X squared will be two X. Okay, so that's going to work. All right, next we're gonna do the derivative of the X component with respect to Z. Uh, that's gonna give us one. And then if we look at the derivative of R with respect to X, that also ends up just being one because it's just an X right here. All right, and then the final cross partial we need to check, we do the derivative of Q with respect to Z and we get zero. And then we do the derivative of R with respect to Y and we also get zero. All right, now assuming that the domain of this is one of these uh, simply connected uh, things with no holes in it, which is actually something we're gonna talk about a little bit later, um, then we know that this is a conservative vector field. So this means that we can write F as the gradient of some scalar value function. All right, so we need to figure out what that is. So we know that we could write F as the gradient of some little f, but how do we figure out what little f is? Well, I think we talked about this in the previous lecture. What we do is we integrate each of these with respect to their matching variable. So we integrate P with respect to X, Q with respect to Y, and R with respect to Z. And then we sort of smash all of the pieces that we find together. And that will give us our F or our potential function. So let's do the integral of this, of P, with respect to X. Let's see, if we do that, we have X squared Y plus X Z. And then since X was the variable, we could potentially have Y's and Z's mixed in with our constants here. Okay, so this is F. Another way of finding F is we integrate Q, which is X squared with respect to Y. And this gives us X squared Y, but we could potentially have some stuff involving X and Z in there too. That's going to be F. And then the final way of getting F is to integrate the R, this component with respect to Z. So we end up getting X, Z, and we could have some stuff involving X and Y in there too. All right, now what we do is we look at all of the pieces that we get from this and we make sure that we have one of each of them. So I see X squared Y showing up. I need to make sure my F has that. And then I see my X's and Z's or my X, Z's showing up. So I need to make sure I have that too. Now it doesn't seem like there are any other types of pieces here. So this is going to be it. This is gonna be my potential function uh, for this right here. So we have just done this to check if it was conservative. Uh, yes, yeah, so you, you could potentially do this process. And then if you get something that doesn't make any sense, uh, then yeah, you can see that it's not uh, conservative here. Uh, plus a constant. Uh, well, we don't really need the constant here because we just need a potential function. So we, we don't need the constant there. Do we need those points? Uh, yeah, we're not quite done yet. We just found the potential function. Now what we're going to do is we're gonna use the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So we will, our whole goal is to do the integral of f dot dr, but another way of writing this is the gradient of a potential function dot dr. All right, so now what we're doing is we have an integral of something like a derivative, a gradient. And so what happens here is we have f of our final point. So our final point was two, two, three, minus f of our initial point which is one negative one, two. So this is how we get around not having a parameterization of C. It turns out that the parameterization of C doesn't matter at all. It only matters what the endpoints are right here. All right, so then all I need to do is just plug in these numbers. 
So I plug in two, two, and three into this. Uh, what are we going to get for that? Um, we're going to get eight. Uh, X times Z will be six. All right. And then we subtract. Um, let's see. X squared times Y will be negative one. And then X times Z will be two. Um, let's see. So this is one, 14 minus one. We end up getting 13 right here. Why does this work though? It's effectively a generalization of the original fundamental theorem of calculus. We're doing an integral of a derivative. So it ends up just washing out to be the endpoints here. So you don't need to break into parametric equations, not at all. In fact, we have no idea what kind of path this is. So there's no way we could write parametric equations for this because we don't know if the points are connected like this or maybe the points are connected in some insane way like, like that. We don't know what path it is and it actually doesn't matter. Only the endpoints matter for this. And we'll get a little bit of intuition as to why that is in a little bit. I'll, I'll kind of give a physics analogy since that's kind of the theme of this chapter. There's a lot of physics relationships. Okay. Now, before we move on to the rest of this lesson, I need to talk about a few pieces of um, terminology here. Oh, wait, why does the gradient in R become F? Um, so the R here was a position. So if we go back to my original definition here, R of B and R of A, these are just positions. So in this problem, we ended at the position two, two, three, and we started at the position one, negative one, two. So we're just plugging those points into here, kind of like how we would plug B and A in if we did an integral back in Calc 1. All right. So I want to talk about a few definitions here. Uh, the first one is, is more or less self-explanatory. A curve is closed if it intersects itself at its endpoints. So it starts where it ends. So here are some examples of closed curves. So this is a closed curve if we start and end maybe at that point. Uh, this is another example of a closed curve. So we just start and end at the same point. Um, here's another example. Ooh, we can zoom around here. We cross ourselves a little bit and then come right there. So all of these are going to be uh, closed curves right here. Why is the why is the volume so high? I didn't do anything to this. Here, let me let me unplug it again. That seems to be the fix. Okay, is that is that too loud? Am I too loud right now? I think it's perfect. I think it's okay. It's good, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry if it's too loud. Um, all right, anyway, so this is what a closed curve is. It just starts and ends at the same point. A curve is simple if it intersects itself only at its endpoints. So for example, this right here, this would be a simple closed curve. However, this, and most certainly this, will not be simple because they intersect themselves uh, elsewhere besides the starting and ending point right here. All right, so these ones are not simple. Um, so let's, as an example, let's try to classify some of these. So determine whether the curve is simple or closed. And it's possible to be uh, neither, and it's also possible to be both as well. So for example, this curve right here, uh, this does not intersect itself at all. So this is neither. This is neither simple nor closed right here. All right, what about this one? So we start at A, we meander around here, and then we come back to the same point at B. So this is both. This is simple and closed because we intersect ourselves there, but we don't intersect ourselves at any other point here. All right, let's see here. Um, for the next part, we kind of go in this figure eight pattern, but like we discussed up there, this will be closed but not simple. And finally, if we start here, we intersect ourselves and then we end here, uh, we're not intersecting ourselves at the endpoints, which is a requirement for both of these terms right here. Um, so this is neither. Is this redundant? If it's simple, it's always closed, right? Uh, yes, so simple implies closed, but closed doesn't necessarily imply 
uh, simple, as we can see with uh, this example right here. All right. So now that we know what these terms are, uh, we can use them as um, pieces of a, of a theorem here. So let F be a continuous vector field and C be a smooth, closed, oriented curve in R3. The line integral F dot T dS sums the tangential components of F along C. This integral is called the circulation of F along C. Since this integral is evaluated on a closed curve, it is often represented symbolically by the line integral symbol, but then we just put a little circle right here. So if you see this little circle on the line integral, this implies that the curve you're going on is going to be closed right here. Yeah, that and it does look kind of cool. <laughs> I won't lie, it looks pretty cool. We're actually gonna have this symbol with double integrals too. So that looks even cooler. All right, so let's go ahead and compute the circulation of a very basic vector field. F is a constant vector field, meaning that every vector we assign to a point is gonna be pointing exactly the same way. And we're gonna do this on the unit circle oriented counterclockwise and A and B are constants right here. All right, well, let's see here. Um, so let's go ahead and come up with a parameterization for the unit circle here. Um, so let's say that X of T will be cosine of T and Y of T will be sine of T. So our goal is to do this right here. But as we saw last class, another better way of writing this will be f dot r prime of t dt. All right, so if r of t is made up of these, let's figure out what r prime is going to be here. Um, so let's see, the derivative of this will be negative sine of t, and the derivative of this will be cosine of t. So there's our r prime. So now what we're going to do is we're going to dot F, which is just the constants A and B um, with R prime here. Well, oh, actually when I wrote DT, I probably shouldn't write it this way anymore. Um, if we go around the circle, this will go from zero to two pi. So that's how I'm going to write it now. This is really more appropriate of a symbol when we have DS right here. Oops, I was gonna write what R prime was. Negative sine of T, cosine of T. All right, so let's go ahead and do the dot product. So we have negative A sine of T plus B cosine of T. All right, well, we know how to do this integral. This is back to a calc one integral. The integral of negative sine will be cosine and the integral of cosine will be sine. And we do this from zero to two pi. All right, so let's go ahead and put two pi into here. Well, cosine of two pi is one, sine of two pi is zero. And then I subtract and I plug zero into here, cosine of zero is also one, and then sine of zero is also one. So we end up with zero as the result of this uh, circulation right here. So that's what we end up getting here. Now it might seem in, in some sense obvious that we're gonna get zero here because we started and ended at the same point. So we started and ended at the same point and we ended up getting zero. So let's see if we can kind of generalize this phenomenon to um, other situations. All right, so if F is a conservative vector field and C is a closed curve, then, uh, yeah, what's up? For the previous example, shouldn't it be A times one minus B times one? Uh, no, because I plug zero in for cosine and it's A times one will be A. I plug zero oh, I in for sine and it'll be sine of zero. I see, thank you. All right. So if F is a conservative vector field, which this was, remember all constant vector fields are going to be conservative. That was a result we've seen previously. So we have a conservative vector field and C is a closed curve. 
then it doesn't matter what type of conservative vector field it is. If you do an integral around a closed curve, then we're gonna end up getting zero for that. So that's honestly a pretty nice result right here. All right, so let's go ahead with that in mind and do the next problem here. So let's evaluate the integral along the closed curve, which is an ellipse right here. Uh, let's do sine of x dx plus z cosine of y dy plus sine of y dz. Okay, now we could do this manually. We could find a parameterization of the ellipse, which isn't too hard to do. And we could substitute it into here and do the integral manually. But based on what we just saw here, I have a feeling that maybe uh, we can avoid a lot of that work. So first of all, an ellipse is a closed curve. Um, so this ellipse will look something like this. So it's a closed curve. So if we can check to see if this vector field is conservative, then we could just say it's gonna integrate to zero here. So if we see the little circle, we know it's a closed curve. That's right, that's what that notation is. Why does it matter if the curve is simple or not? We're gonna to get to that uh, in a later um, theorem here. Where are the endpoints on a circle located? Um, for this case, it doesn't matter. We just start and end at the same place. It doesn't matter which place we start, which place we end. All right. So another way we could write this circulation integral is sine of x, uh, z cosine of y, and then sine of y dotted with dr. And remember that dr is like the differential vector. It has dx, dy, and dz. So this, this problem, even though it didn't look like it at first, this is just another version of f dot dr right here. All right, so if we can verify that this uh, vector field is conservative, uh, then we know it's just gonna be zero. So let's check to see if that's true. So we have p, q, and r right here. So let's check uh, p sub y. Well, let's see, p sub y will be zero, okay? And then q sub x, well, there aren't any x's in here, so that will be zero as well. All right, now let's check p sub z. Well, there aren't any z's in there, so that's zero. And then we check r sub x, and there aren't any x's in there, so that's zero. So that works out. And then finally, we have q sub z. Okay, this is a non-trivial result. We end up getting cosine of y for that. And then we end up with r sub y, but that's just the derivative of sine of y, which is cosine of y. So those are gonna end up matching as well. So we now know that F is conservative, which implies that F dot dr equals zero. There's another way that you can see why this works. Remember by the fundamental theorem of line integrals that um, f dot dr is the gradient of f dot dr, if it's conservative. We need it to be conservative for this to work. So this is going to be f of, um, so if we start and end at the same point, we have f of b minus f of a. But if it's a closed curve, that means B equals A because we start and end at the same point right here. So this is just gonna be F of B minus F of B, which is zero. So if we have a closed curve, we start and end at the same point, meaning we're plugging the same thing into our potential function. Um, so we're gonna subtract the same number here and get zero. So that's like a little mini proof. Uh, for why this works. Okay. Now uh, let's see here. Let's let's do some more examples with these uh, these line integrals right here. Okay. So given that f is the vector field y comma x, p is the point one zero, and q is the point negative one zero, 
evaluate the line integral f dot dr by choosing c to be the line segment connecting p to q. So what we're doing is we're integrating along this path right here. We're going, we're starting at p and then we're going this way and then we're gonna end up at q right here. All right, so they want us to kind of do this uh, quote unquote the old fashioned way. They want us to parameterize this path and then do the line integral that way. Now, as we're gonna see in a little bit, I'm gonna spoil it right now. This is gonna be the harder way of doing this, but it's, it's gonna, I'm gonna prove a point with this. So our parameterizations, so we have a line segment. So the parameterization for that, um, let's see, we go from one to negative one, our X will be one minus two T, and then our Y is just zero the whole time. So you could check, and this ends up being a parameterization of this line segment where we start at T equals zero here and T equals one right here. Negative two T, yeah, that's because over the space of one second or one T interval, we decrease by two right here. That's why the slope is negative two for this. All righty, so now we have our parameterization. So let's go ahead and do our integral. So we had F dot dr, which another way of writing this will be the integral from zero to one of f dot r prime of t dt. All right, well, let's see. Now f has the parameter or as is the vector field y x here. So y, this is y and this is x, y is zero, x is one minus two t. And then r prime, if we do the derivative of this, uh, we're gonna get negative two, zero. We're running out of space here. Okay, now if you look at this dot product, we have zero times negative two, and then we have one minus two t times zero. Well, that's just a nice way of writing zero. So we end up with zero as this integral right here. Although interesting, we got zero as this, uh, but this really isn't a closed path right here. So that goes to show you that you can get zero even if you don't have a closed path. Why did I flip the vector? Um, oh, it's because we have y x here. I was plugging it into f right there. Okay, now let's suppose that we go along a different path. So we're still going from P to Q, but this time we're going along this upper semicircle right here instead. So let's see what we get for the line integral in that case. Let's see if it's the same as what we get here. So this time, if we're going along the unit circle counterclockwise, my X of T will be cosine of T. And my y of t will be sine of t right here. Okay, so let's figure out what r prime is. So we take the derivative of x and we get negative sine. Take the derivative of y and we get cosine. Okay, so this is r and this is r prime. All right, it's time to do our integral again. Let's just go ahead and see if this gives us the same thing, or maybe changing the path will change the value. Okay, so this time, it seems like we need to go from t is zero to t is pi to get the circle or the half circle. And we're gonna have the vector field y x. So y is sine, x is cosine. And then we dot it with r prime of t. Okay, so that's what we get by setting that up right here. Let's do our dot product. Now, this time it doesn't seem like it's just going to be zero. We have negative sine squared, if we do this times this, and then we add cosine squared. Okay, now this is a, probably a trig identity we don't really use too often. Uh, let me write it a little bit more suggestively. Does anyone know what this is equal to here? Does anyone know what, what this one is? Cosine of 2t, that's right. It's the double angle formula for cosine. 
That was one we ended up not really using in Calc 2. We used the double angle for sine a fair bit, but we didn't use it for cosine. Uh, but this is going to help us here. So this is the same thing as doing the integral from zero to pi of cosine of 2t. So we integrate this. We go from zero to pi. And then sine of 2 pi will be 0. And then sine of 0 will be 0. So it was a little bit suspenseful there. We didn't just straight up get 0 in the integral, but we did end up getting 0 for the integral overall. So we see that no matter which path we decide to take, we're going to end up getting the same value. OK, now maybe that was just a fluke. Maybe coincidentally, the line and the upper semicircle gave the same um, value this time, but maybe if I went like, ooh, you know, I do something like this, uh, it's going to give me something different. Uh, but it turns out it's not going to be a coincidence here. Uh, I'm going to illustrate that in the next theorem here. Uh, you have a question? You spoiled it. <laughs> but yeah, that, that, that's what's going to end up being. Yeah, so, so the audience noticed that um, this is a conservative vector field and that's going to bring us to our next part right here. Okay, so we could do this uh, problem instead by first finding a potential function for f. So f is going to be y and x right here. Y is f, y, x. That's just how it was given in the problem. That's the vector field that we're working with here. All uh, right. So f is y, x. Uh, let's see. Uh, since they're asking for a potential function, I'm just going to assume that one exists, though we could check the cross partials if you'd like. Um, but I'm going to integrate y with respect to x and get xy plus potentially a function of y. So that's our f. And then I'm going to integrate x with respect to y. And that gives me the same thing plus potentially a function of x here. Now it seems like xy is the only piece right here. So I'm going to use the potential function just x times y. All right, so now if I want to evaluate my line integral, f dot dr, well, now I know that f is conservative and I can write it as a gradient. Okay, and then by the fundamental theorem for line integrals, this is going to be f of, let's see, what was the the second point, I think it was negative one zero minus f of one zero right here. So we just go ahead and plug that into our potential function. We have negative one times zero minus one times zero. That again will be zero right here. All right, so this goes to show you why conservative vector fields are so nice. It's because we can use the fundamental theorem for line integrals with them. Okay, now we're kind of coming to the, the climax of this. This is going to be pretty interesting. Let F be a continuous vector field with domain D. The vector field F is independent of path if for any path C1 and C2 uh, with the same initial and terminal points, we have that their line integrals are the same. So if the phenomenon that happened in these problems back here happens with a vector field, then we say that this vector field is independent of path right here. All right, so the, it doesn't matter which path we take, our line integrals will end up being the same. Okay, now if F is continuous on an open connected region, then the line integral F dot dr is independent of path if and only if F is conservative. So what, what does if and only if mean? It means that the two statements are equivalent. They're saying the same thing. So saying that F is conservative is saying that the line integral is independent of path. So not only can we go this way, we, we saw in the problem that if F is conservative, then it's uh, independent, but we could actually go the other way too. If the line integral is independent, then we know that F is conservative as well right here. Okay, but that kind of begs the question here. So we know what F is continuous. We know what that means. Each of its components are gonna be continuous, uh, but what is an open connected region? So we need to talk about what that is to make sure that we have that satisfied in order to use this result right here. Are you guys drawing the if and only if double arrow? Yeah, you, yeah. a way to symbolize this is 
uh, the double headed arrow right here. It means this implies this, and then this implies that right there. All right, so let's talk about what an open connected region is. So time for a little more terminology here. Okay. A region is open if it does not contain any of its boundary points. So probably the easiest uh, examples of these are intervals back in Calc 1. So for example, 0, 1 is an open interval, but something like 0, 1, where we include the endpoints, that's not going to be open. Uh, a circle where we go up to the boundary of the circle, but don't include the circle itself, that's okay. But a circle where we actually include its boundary as well, um, that's not going to work. So that's what open means right here. All right, now an open region is connected if any two points in D can be connected by a continuous curve lying entirely in D. I think this, this, this one's uh, relatively intuitive here. So for example, if we have a shape, maybe something you know, like this, uh, this is connected because I could draw any two points I want and I can have a path in them uh, between them that lies entirely in there. But let's say if my region is kind of split up into like islands like this, I can pick a point here and a point here, uh, but there's no way to connect these two points while you're entirely lying in the region that you care about. So connected means it's all one shape. It's not split up into to islands or multiple pieces like this. Now it's time for the final definition here. An open region is simply connected if every simple closed curve of D can be contracted to a point in D without ever leaving D. So this is a bit more complicated. The simple thing, the simple way of thinking about this is no holes. So let's, let's look at some examples here. Determine whether the region is simply connected. D1 is the re region that removes the origin from R2. So we have the entire plane, but we're not allowed to have the origin right here. Also, if our points are on the edge, do we have a problem? Um, well, if it's open, then we won't include any points on the edge, so we wouldn't need to worry about that. But even if we're on the edge right here, we could just kind of immediately go into the domain and then connect anywhere we want. So it's not really a problem if we do um, include the edge here for connecting. All right, let's talk about this. So what this is saying is if every simple closed curve, so every non-intersecting kind of loop in D can be contracted to a point, what that means is you can kind of take it and shrink it until it gets to a point and you don't have to kind of lift it up out of the page. So let's see here. So this is our space right here. Like, let's say we have this kind of loop. What we could do is we could kind of shrink this loop until it gets down to this point and then we're good to go. However, let's say I take a loop and I put it around this point that we're missing, right? If I try to shrink this, what's going to happen is that this eventually is going to have to pass through the origin right here. In order for all of this stuff to be contracted to here, uh, some of the points back here are gonna have to pass along through the origin here. So that is not going to work out. So is this simply connected? No, this is not simply connected. And why is it not simply connected? Because it has a hole in it. Okay, now let's think about this. So D2 is the region that removes the origin from R3. Okay, let's think about this. Maybe it'll be the same way as this, or maybe it'll be different. So we're eliminating the origin from this right here. Um, and then we have, let's say we draw some kind of loop here. So this loop looks like it's going around the origin, but what you could do is you can almost kind of pull the loop out of the page and have it pass around the origin. And then you can contract it to here. So the issue that, ha that plagued us for the previous uh, example here doesn't really affect us for this one because we have an extra dimension of space to work with. So yes, this is simply connected because we can move this loop uh, through the third dimension and then just contract it right here. All right. 
Now, let's, let's up the ante with R3 right here. D3 is the region that removes the Z axis from R3. Okay, so this time, I'm gonna to try to draw a dotted line here for the Z axis. Now we have this going on. Now, if we draw a loop around the Z axis, like let's say it's kind of like a ring going around the Z axis, will I be able to contract that to a point or can I not? All right, looks like we have some nose and the nose have it, that's right. Because if we try to kind of stretch this and fold it around so we can track to a point here, we're at some point going to have to cross the Z axis. So this kind of piece of the loop back here in order to bring it towards this point, it's gonna to have to move over the Z axis. Like you might think, oh, well, maybe I could just bend it low enough and then pull it over. Well, the Z axis goes on forever. So we can't do something like that. So this is not simply connected. Because a point in 2D is a line in 3D. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of what's going on here. Um, so something that's uh, two dimensions lower or higher dimensional will be enough to block it from being simply connected. So a point would work with R2 and a line would work for R3. Now this stuff is all kind of just prerequisites uh, for the theorem that we're about to state here. We're not gonna spend a bunch of time doing this. If, if you're interested in kind of thinking this way, I'd recommend taking a class called uh, topology. It's an upper level math class, it's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, but we're not gonna be doing a whole lot with this. This is just kind of prerequisites for the theorem uh, that we're going to have here. I don't get number one. So we, in order to contract the circle to this point, and we're only allowed to move an R2, so we can't move this up or down over the X right here. We're going to have to pull all of that stuff through the X. So you can almost imagine that there's like a spike kind of rammed into the ground right here. And if we wanted to kind of pull this rope into one point, the rope would have to touch the spike right here. Is the second example dependent on the plane it's in? Um, no, not really. So we could have a point anywhere in any kind of closed loop. And we could just move it to a different plane that this point doesn't occupy and just move it there. So this one doesn't really depend on that. Don't worry too much about this. This is, a, this is just a bit academic. We're, these are just going to be prerequisites for the next part, which is the, really the important part of what I'm trying to get out here. I just kind of wanted to give you a kind of a brief illustration of what that is. All right. So I wanna talk about some things that end up being the same for line integrals. And this is how we really are gonna think about line integrals here. Let F be continuous on an open, simply connected region D. So there can't be any holes, we can include the boundary and we need to make sure it's just one thing. It's not made up of like separate islands or anything like that. Now, the nice thing about this is that R2 and R3 satisfy this. So R2 and R3 just as a whole are open and simply connected. So if they don't specify any kind of restraints or we don't kind of have any um, uh, domain restrictions, then we don't really need to think about this at all. But suppose we have such a region, then the following statements are equivalent, meaning these are four different ways of saying the same thing. So the first statement is that F is conservative. So this is this uh, kind of concept or term referring to a vector field that's been very important for us. So that's one way of saying all of this. Um, the next part is kind of what we talked about earlier. If F is conservative, then if you do a line integral, it's independent of path. So it doesn't matter which path you take, the line integral is gonna end up the same. Uh, related to this, if we have a conservative vector field and we start and end at the same place, then by the fundamental theorem for line integrals, as we saw earlier, we're gonna end up getting zero that. And then finally, another condition that's equivalent to conservative is we have the cross partial property. So this is kind of how we check to see if things are conservative or not. So all four of these are just four different ways of saying the same thing right here. And these two right, this one actually right here, this is probably the, the nicest one. We don't need to worry about a particular parameterization giving us something different right here. All right, so let's see. So the simply connectedness matters in the theorem above. So this is an example, if time permits. Let's see if time permits here. 
Hmm. It's like right on the edge. Um, let me just summarize what this is. And then I want to give kind of a more intuitive kind of explanation for this right here. So wait, how did the screen get all wonky? What the heck? Oh boy, I don't know why that happened. All right, well, anyways, let me just go over this example. I will summarize it and um, I'll kind of let you know what it's talking about. So suppose we have a vector field f of xy is equal to this. Now, as a domain, this vector field has all of R2, because we have x's and y's, except for one point. And it's the point that makes these denominators zero. So this is going to be R2, except for the origin. Now, on the previous page here, when we were talking about this simply connected stuff, we actually had that as a specific example. We said that R2 with the origin removed is not simply connected. So find the domain of F is it simply connected? The answer is no, because we're missing the origin right here. Now we can show that this is conservative. So if we do the cross partials here, um, then we're gonna be able to have these be equal. So this part works. So this fourth statement right here works, uh, but this is not a simply connected domain. So this is gonna cause us some issues. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna show that the line integral f dot dr is pi, where c1 is the upper half of the unit circle. So let's draw a picture of what this is. So we have our R2, but without the origin here. So we're removing that. And we're going along this path. So we're starting here and we're ending here. This will be c1. And if we do our line integral along this path, then we're gonna end up having our line integral give us pi. And I'm going to skip the work for that. Um, we just would parameterize it with X is cosine, Y is sine, and we would do it the same as we did the problem. Okay, now on the other hand, let's say that we connected these two points differently. Let's say that we connected them. So here's our R2, our punctured plane. This is actually called, this is the punctured plane. Uh, we have our punctured plane with our points connected this way. So we just have the lower half circle. Now, if we do the lower half circle C2, then we end up with negative pi instead. So if we connect the two paths this way, we get pi, but if we connect them this way, we're gonna get negative pi. And this contradicts the theorem on the previous page, or at least it seems to. We found two different paths to take between the same points, but it ended up giving us different values here. Now, does this contradict the theorem? Does that mean whatever I told you back here is like totally wrong, just made up nonsense? No, it doesn't contradict that because it doesn't satisfy the hypothesis. It needs to be open, simply connected for this to work right here. So it needs to be open and simply connected here in order for us to have this path equivalence for our vector fields. So that's kind of the moral of the story. So that shows you what happens if we don't have this. But for most nice domains where we're not um, kind of removing a hole or something like that, then we don't really need to think too hard about this condition here. Okay, now I wanna kind of give some general intuition and this might be easier for those of you who have taken uh, physics before. I want you guys to think about this in terms of potential energy. So for those of you who had physics, you guys have heard of potential energy, right? So there's, there's potential energy associated with uh, the force due to gravity right here. I mean, I don't know where I'm going to write this. We'll just write it back. So let's talk about potential energy due to gravity, right? So let's say we have a hill like this, right? So here's our hill. And let's say we start, and this will be a 3D hill. So this is kind of the, the top of the hill right there. Uh, so let's say we start on, down here on this hill. So this is our point A. We're starting down here. And let's say our potential energy due to gravity down here will be zero. Now, what we're going to do is we're gonna take a little path. So we're gonna move up here, and then we're going to meander around like this, and then we're gonna come back to here. So we come back to B. 
What does our potential energy do to gravity now? It's still going to be zero. That's right. So this is why if we have a closed loop with a conservative vector field and gravity is a conservative force, it's not a coincidence those words are the same, then we're going to have zero change in energy if we go around a closed loop like this. Here's another example. Let's say we want to find out the amount of work done due to gravity. So let's drive another hill. Let's say I start down here. Let's say my PE is zero here. And let's say up here, my potential energy to due to gravity would be one. So let's say I go on some kind of crazy path. So I'm meandering around like this. I go off the hill for a little bit. You know, maybe I fly into the air somehow, who knows? And I come back to the ground and then I come to this point right here. How much work did gravity do on this object? That's right. So because F is a conservative force, because gravity is conservative, it doesn't matter what kind of insane path we do. It only matters about the difference in the potentials. So this would be like our F of B, and this would be like our F of A. So what we did today in class is essentially just the, the mathematical under the hood version of what you may have done in physics. Oh, is that negative or positive? Actually, that would be negative work technically. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, technically the work would be negative one here, uh, but the point still remains. It only matters what we're doing at the endpoints here. So if you ever get confused about these concepts, but you've taken physics before, uh, think about what we just did today in terms of this right here. This is talking about uh, the closed loops of a conservative force being zero. And this is talking about the fundamental theorem of line integrals right here. Or, no, I shouldn't write like that. This is talking about f dot dr is f of b minus f of a, or these are the endpoints. So this is kind of a visual illustration of these two concepts right here. All right, so anyways, that's all I have for today. Now let's see here. It looks like a minute or two early. I don't really have enough time to show the details for the other problems. So I guess we're just gonna have to, to quit here. And next class, we're going to learn about another version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this is going to relate double integrals to single integrals. So we're gonna up the number of integrals by one for the next time. All right, so I will see you guys then.